The land of Israel, steeped in history and spirituality, served as the backdrop for the life of Jesus. This land, considered holy by Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, has been a crossroads of civilizations for millennia. Its ancient cities, like Jerusalem and Bethlehem, resonated with the echoes of prophets and patriarchs. It was within this rich tapestry of faith and tradition that Jesus was born and raised. The very ground on which he walked held the weight of biblical narratives and divine promises. In the Jewish tradition, childhood held a special significance, viewed as a time for nurturing faith. Children were seen as gifts from God, entrusted to parents to raise in accordance with the Torah. From a young age, children were immersed in the stories, laws, and rituals of their faith. They learned about the covenant with Abraham and the exodus from Egypt. Education played a crucial role, with a strong emphasis on studying and understanding the scriptures. Boys were encouraged to become learned in the Torah, often attending synagogue schools. Family and community played an integral part in shaping the lives of Jewish children. Festivals like Passover and Sukkot provided opportunities for families to come together and celebrate their heritage. Imagine a young Jesus, just five years old, playing by a stream, the sun dappling the water with patterns of light and shadow. He cupped his hands around the flowing water, gathering it into small pools that shimmered like jewels. His nimble fingers gathered soft clay from the bank, molding it with grace into twelve sparrows, their forms so lifelike they seemed poised for flight. Unbeknownst to Jesus, a man was watching, his heart hardening with every moment. He approached Joseph, Jesus' father, his voice tight with disapproval. Your child is violating the Sabbath. Joseph, worried, made his way to the stream. He saw Jesus shaping the clay. Why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? He asked. Jesus looked up at his father, his eyes filled with a wisdom that belied his tender years. He seemed unfazed by the accusation, his gaze steady and serene. With a gentle clap of his hands, he signaled to the sparrows. As if imbued with life itself, the clay figures stirred, their wings fluttering with newfound strength. They rose into the air, circling above the children's upturned faces before soaring into the vast expanse of the sky. The onlookers, both children and adults alike, gasped in astonishment, their eyes wide with wonder. They had witnessed something extraordinary, something that defied the laws of nature as they understood them. Word of the miracle spread like wildfire, whispers carried on the wind to the furthest corners of the village. Among the crowd was a scribe's son, his heart filled with envy and resentment. He had heard the whispers, had seen the awe in the eyes of the villagers, and a bitter jealousy took root within him. Taking a willow branch, he marched towards the stream, his face contorted with anger. With a violent sweep of his arm, he disrupted the pools of water that Jesus had so carefully created, his laughter echoing cruelly in the sudden silence. Jesus watched, his demeanor shifting from gentle serenity to righteous anger. His voice, normally as sweet as honey, resonated with a power that silenced the laughter and drew the attention of all those gathered. You wicked, foolish person, he said, his gaze piercing the scribe's son to his very core. What harm did the water do to you? Now, you will wither like a tree and bear no leaves or fruit. As Jesus spoke, a hush fell over the crowd. The air crackled with an unseen energy, and the scribe's son, his face contorted in terror, felt a searing pain shoot through his body. His skin, once flushed with youthful vigor, turned pale and lifeless, and his limbs, moments ago so full of life, began to tremble uncontrollably. With a gasp, he collapsed to the ground, his body racked with pain. Panic erupted among the onlookers. The boy's parents, their faces etched with grief and anger, rushed to his side, their cries of anguish piercing the heavy silence. They gathered their withered son in their arms, his once vibrant form now frail and lifeless, and carried him to Joseph, their voices hoarse with accusation. Your child does such terrible things, they cried, their words heavy with blame. The shadow of this incident seemed to follow Jesus. As he walked through the village, his brow furrowed in thought. A child, caught up in the exuberance of play, bumped into him. Jesus, his patience worn thin by the weight of the accusations leveled against him, reacted with uncharacteristic anger. You will not finish your journey, he said, his voice laced with a power he seemed unable to control. The child, as if struck by an unseen force, stumbled and fell, his laughter dying in his throat. A hush fell over the village, the air thick with a palpable sense of dread. The child lay still, 
his eyes staring vacantly at the sky, his chest no longer rising and falling with the rhythm of life. Word of this latest tragedy reached the child's parents, their hearts shattering at the news. They rushed to the scene, their cries of anguish mingling with the murmurs of the crowd. They pointed accusing fingers at Joseph, their voices trembling with rage. You can't live in this village with a child who kills our children, they spat, their words heavy with venom. Joseph, his heart heavy with sorrow and a growing sense of unease, took Jesus aside. Why do you do these things? He asked, his voice a mixture of pleading and reproof. People hate us and persecute us because of you. Jesus looked at his earthly father, his gaze filled with a wisdom that belied his tender years. I know these words aren't yours, but for your sake, I will stay quiet, he said, his voice calm and steady. However, they will face their punishment. Joseph, witnessing the immediate blindness that fell upon the accusers, felt a shiver run down his spine. Fear tightened its grip on his heart. Back home, Joseph reprimanded Jesus. Why, child, why? Don't you see the fear you instill? Jesus, his voice soft yet steady, replied, These words are born of fear, not understanding. Do you not know who I am? The question hung heavy with divine authority. Word of Jesus' unusual wisdom reached the ears of a local teacher named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, a learned man, felt a spark of curiosity ignite within him. He approached Joseph, his face a mixture of apprehension and eagerness. I hear tales, Joseph, he began, tales of your son's unique understanding. Perhaps it is time he received formal instruction. And so it was agreed. Each day, young Jesus would sit before Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus attempted to impart the basics of the alphabet. Jesus, however, seemed less than impressed. He listened patiently, his brow furrowed in thought. Then with a sigh, he interrupted. Teacher, if you truly understand these symbols, explain the true essence of Aleph. Only then will I believe your understanding of Bet, Zacchaeus stammered, his face flushing. He found himself speechless before a child. For the first time, Zacchaeus felt the true weight of his own ignorance. He realized he was not equipped to teach this child. Life, as it often does, continued its relentless course. Children, their laughter echoing through the dusty streets, chased each other in a game of tag. Jesus joined in their games, finding solace in their untainted hearts. One boy scrambled onto a low rooftop, his laughter echoing. His foot slipped, transforming laughter into a shriek as he tumbled over the edge. Jesus leaped from the rooftop, landing softly beside the fallen child. Villagers watched as Jesus gently shook the child, calling his name. The child's eyes fluttered open, drawing a shaky breath. Joseph, a skilled carpenter, had received a commission from a wealthy merchant, a bed frame, sturdy and ornate, fit for a man of his stature. He worked tirelessly in the shade of a sprawling sycamore tree, the rhythmic thud of his hammer a familiar sound in the village. But as the day wore on, frustration etched lines on his face. One of the beams, he realized with a sinking heart, was too short, a costly mistake that threatened to delay the project. Jesus, observing his father's struggle, approached the workbench, his brow furrowed in thought. Father, he said, his voice calm and measured, lay the beams as they should be, one next to the other. Do not concern yourself with the difference in their length. Joseph, though skeptical, followed his son's instructions. He carefully positioned the beams, the shorter one lying beside its longer counterpart, a visible gap separating their ends. Jesus stepped forward, his small hand resting on the end of the shorter beam. He closed his eyes, his brow furrowed in concentration. And for a moment, the air hung heavy with an unseen energy. Then, as if responding to an unspoken command, the wood creaked and groaned, the shorter beam lengthening seamlessly until it matched its companion perfectly. Joseph watched, his mouth agape, his years of experience as a carpenter rendered meaningless in the face of this impossible act. The sudden restoration of sight to those struck blind sent a ripple of fear through the crowd. Whispers, hushed and urgent, escaped their lips. Some fell to their knees, hands clasped in prayer. Others backed away from Joseph and Jesus, eyes wide with fear. Joseph placed a protective hand on Jesus' shoulder. Neighbors regarded them with awe and suspicion. Mary watched in silence, her heart heavy. That evening, a knock came at their door. It was a village elder, his face etched with wisdom. Joseph, we are simple folk, bound by tradition. These abilities your son possesses are unsettling. We mean you no harm, but... Joseph nodded in understanding. Mary listened intently, her hand on her belly. We seek no trouble, no notoriety. We only wish to live in peace. But a seed of doubt took root in Joseph's heart. 
Could true peace ever be found in a world that feared and coveted his son's power? Zacchaeus, the village teacher, couldn't shake his encounter with young Jesus. He, a man of knowledge, was rendered speechless by a child. He questioned the essence of Aleph, the first letter. Was it just a symbol or something deeper? He realized he had knowledge, but lacked true wisdom. The next morning he sought guidance from Joseph. He confessed his inability to comprehend Jesus' wisdom. A collective gasp escaped the lips of the villagers. The child, moments ago lifeless, sat up, his eyes clear and bright. Mothers clutched their children close, hearts pounding. The impossible had happened before their eyes. The child's mother, tears of joy, scooped him into her arms. The boy, seemingly unharmed, clung to his mother. Whispers rippled through the crowd. Jesus watched with calmness, unfazed by the gazes. Joseph, his own hands calloused from years of working with wood, reached out, his fingers trembling slightly, and touched the perfectly joined beams. The wood, still warm from the sun's embrace, felt smooth and solid beneath his fingertips. He traced the grain, his mind struggling to reconcile what his eyes had witnessed, what his hands now confirmed. There was no seam, no join, no evidence of any alteration. The beam, once too short, now fit perfectly, as if it had always been so. A profound silence filled the carpentry workshop, broken only by the sound of Joseph's ragged breathing. The air, thick with the scent of sawdust and cedar wood, seemed to crackle with an unseen energy, a residue of the power that had just been unleashed. He looked at his son, his heart overflowing with a mixture of pride, awe, and a sliver of fear that he couldn't quite quell. Overwhelmed by emotion, Joseph did something he had never done before. He knelt before his son, tears welling in his eyes, and embraced him tightly. He didn't speak, words seemed woefully inadequate in that moment, but the depth of his love, his reverence, his utter bewilderment, spoke volumes. Jesus, sensing his father's turmoil, returned the embrace, a gentle smile gracing his lips. He understood the burden his father carried, the weight of expectation, the fear of the unknown. He had not come to sow discord, but to fulfill a destiny that even he, in his human form, was only beginning to comprehend. James, Jesus' younger brother, played with carefree abandon, chasing butterflies in the sun-drenched fields. His laughter turned to a scream as he stumbled upon a viper. The viper bit him, its venom coursing through his veins. Mary rushed to his side, her heart pounding. Jesus arrived, knelt beside James, and touched him with a healing power. The viper burst into pieces, leaving the villagers in awe. Word of Jesus' healing powers spread through the village like wildfire, carried on the wind to the furthest corners of their world. One day, a distraught mother, her face etched with the raw agony of loss, approached their humble home. In her arms, she cradled the lifeless body of her child, his skin cold and pale, his eyes staring vacantly at the sky. Those gathered outside gasped, their hearts heavy with a mixture of pity and morbid curiosity. Joseph, ever mindful of the potential for misunderstanding, placed a reassuring hand on the woman's shoulder, his voice a low murmur of comfort. Jesus, however, needed no explanation. He saw the raw grief in the mother's eyes, felt the icy grip of death clinging to the child's spirit. He gently took the child's hand in his own, his touch as light as a feather, yet radiating a warmth that seemed to defy the coldness of death. The crowd watched in stunned silence as color returned to the child's face, his chest heaving with the effort of drawing breath. His eyes, moments ago vacant and lifeless, fluttered open, their gaze fixing on his mother's face with a look of recognition. A collective gasp, a mixture of awe and disbelief, escaped the lips of the onlookers. Jesus, his expression a mixture of sadness and acceptance, gently lifted the child into his mother's arms. Remember this moment, he whispered, his voice barely audible above the gasps of the crowd. Remember the love that binds us, that transcends even the finality of death. Life in the village continued its relentless rhythm. A group of men returned, carrying their fallen comrade. They encountered Jesus, his presence radiating quiet authority. Jesus placed his hand on the dead man's chest. The man's chest heaved with a sudden breath. The crowd erupted in excited chatter. The Passover festival, a time of celebration and spiritual renewal, had always held a special significance for Jesus' family. It was during this festival, 12 years earlier, that Mary and Joseph had first realized the extraordinary nature of their son. 
Now as they made their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a sense of foreboding hung heavy in the air. The bustling streets of Jerusalem, thronged with pilgrims from distant lands, seemed to swallow them whole. Days turned into a nightmarish blur as they searched frantically for their son, their hearts pounding with each dead end, each unanswered question. Finally, guided by a combination of intuition and sheer desperation, they made their way to the temple, its massive stone walls a beacon of hope in their increasingly desperate search. And there, in the temple courtyard, amidst a group of learned rabbis, sat Jesus. He was engaged in a lively debate, his young voice ringing with a clarity and wisdom that belied his tender years. The rabbis, their faces etched with a mixture of astonishment and admiration, listened intently, their years of study seemingly dwarfed by the depth of understanding emanating from this child. Mary and Joseph, watching from a distance, felt a wave of relief wash over them, followed immediately by a surge of apprehension. Their son, their precious child, was no longer content to simply observe, to absorb the teachings of his elders. He was challenging them, pushing the boundaries of their understanding, his words carrying the weight of a wisdom that seemed to transcend the limitations of human experience. As the sun set over Nazareth, a hush fell over the village. The air crackled with unspoken words and memories. Stories of Jesus' childhood miracles wove into their lives. Sparrows brought to life restored sight and defied nature. Each tale painted a portrait of a child unlike any other. Villagers struggled to reconcile these events with their beliefs. This child blurred the lines between the earthly and divine. Joseph questioned what he had always held to be true. How do you reconcile the mundane with the miraculous? Mary treasured glimpses into the divine nature of her son. Greatness came with a heavy price, overshadowing childhood joys. As Jesus grew, so too did the whispers surrounding him. Some saw in him the fulfillment of ancient prophecies, the long-awaited Messiah. Others whispered of sorcery, their words laced with fear. But through it all, Jesus remained unchanged. He moved with grace, his heart filled with love. He healed the sick and comforted the grieving. He spoke of a kingdom where love reigned supreme. The stories of Jesus' childhood became an integral part of the Christian tradition. They were told and retold, their details embellished. They served as a testament to his divinity. They remind us of the divine spark within each of us. Faith often takes root in unexpected places. They challenge us to embrace the possibility of the miraculous. The echoes of those early miracles continue to inspire us. They invite us to open our hearts to a world transformed by love. Amen.